back to 1995 yes it's working general public awareness of the ufo phenomenon and its associated motifs uh were at its zenith um paranormally themed magazines uh were sprung up by the multitude the x-files was riding high uh the image of greys was everywhere uh and travis walton and Whitley Stryber, their respective stories both filmed, dined out on their apparent experiences, and the Schwa Corporation, who remembers them, quietly took the piss out of the whole thing. Hints abounded with official knowledge of alien life, uh, a notion mirrored and inadvertently reinforced by Mulder and Scully for an hour every Tuesday night when they weren't busy looking for somewhere to sit. Suddenly, the whole Western world was at least on nodding terms with the whole idea about UFO culture. Central to all of this was Roswell, alleged site of a crashed flying saucer in 1947, and the subsequent retrieval of the craft, or at least what was left of it, its technology and even its inhabitants. As always, proof was seriously lacking, but as per in conspiracy circles, lack of evidence implies a cover-up. Uh, there have been persistent rumours of solid artefacts deep in the hangars or under them of Wright Batterson AFB, reports ranging from handkerchief sized pieces of metal that magically would uh, unfold when crumbled all the way up to the whole complex being the unofficial Zeta Reticulin embassy on Earth. And here we see Major Jesse Marcel demonstrating an alien self covering duvet set, apparently. Anyway, then came something that ever so briefly outdid all of them. Into this cultural miasma, like a well-timed pinball propelled into the game, came an altogether juicier rumour. Actual film of the autopsy supposedly performed on the extraterrestrial crew. This is that story. For a number of years, there have been rumours circulating in ufology circles that such footage was out there. For example, Mike Maloney, who was a former group chief photographer at the Mirror Group, came to about a private viewing in Los Angeles at the home of a, a Disney executive in the late 70s. But now it was apparently to be revealed to the wider world. And of course, the timing couldn't have been better. The story went that Ray Santilli, um, home video entrepreneur and Aid Edmondson Tribute Act, had travelled to the USA in 1992 in search of rare Elvis Presley footage. Now, just stop for a second and think how likely you are to go around junk shops and find unfound Elvis Presley footage, but anyway, let's let that pump past. And while he failed to find it, because of course he failed to find that, instead he claimed he met a retired US military cameraman who had a lot more intriguing story to tell and film to back it up, because the fabled autopsy footage, which this cameraman claimed to have, and also claimed to have personally filmed. Santilli said he really immediately realised just how significant this would be. So he bought the 22 reels of stock this guy had, um, brought it home, and he wanted to show it to the world to answer one of our greatest questions, and in so doing, make his investment back many, many times over. Uh, and a preview of the edited down 17-minute footage, um, Santilli claimed there was an awful lot more, including footage of the crash site and various other bits, um, was presented to journalists at the screening, including the then FT editor Bob Rickard, on the 5th of May 1995. Bob said at the time that the autopsy's subject was all very humanoid, and his immediate impression was actually it was a really clever model. As the film progressed, Rickard noticed quite a number of inconsistencies, such as the fact that the brain just appeared to lift straight out from the skull with no apparent attachment you know there was no knives or anything to try and remove it um that none of the removed organs were measured or weighed or bagged or tagged or even really looked at um which you would think would be scrutinized to a molecular level if it was really an alien body uh, and all this happened within according to the period authentic clock on the wall half an hour 
which you think would take an awful lot longer if it was an alien body that was being autopsied. Overall, because of these reasons, Bob concluded that it was a fantasy post-modern post-mortem on a fake ET. And the overwhelming impression he got was that the room felt much the same way. And indeed, he related that at the very end, when somebody from UFO magazine started pressing Santilli about authentication, um, Santilli basically picked up his bag and buggered off out of the back door. So, you know, didn't want to answer questions, and to this day, he still doesn't really. Anyway, regardless, wider anticipation of the film continued to build until on August the 28th, 1995, Channel 4 in the UK broadcast the autopsy footage as a segment of the Roswell incident, which was part of their Secret History series. Secret History was a long-running strand on Channel 4. Um, and often as not, it covered quite sober topics, such as the uh, confidential uh, operations leading up to the D-Day landings, Cold War operations, um, and things like that, things that have been in restricted files or official secrets for a very, very long time. Occasionally, it would make forays into more fortune areas, but quite often that was more of the conspiracy fear than it was anything to do with UFOs or anything like that. So this was quite unusual, really. In keeping the series' usual format, it was unsensational. Um, it just related the story and the surrounding arguments pro and con, um, with comments from experts such as the noted uh, pathologist Dr. Ian West from Guy's Hospital and special effects specialist Bob Keane of Pinewood, uh, both of them on the programme basically said they, they, they thought it was fake. At the same time, however, on the other side of the Atlantic, the first American showing was a bit less understated. Um, enveloped, as it was, in a Fox special hosted by Commander Riker himself, Jonathan Frakes, with the title, Alien Autopsy, Fact or Fiction? Experts galore were wheeled onto it to pronounce upon its veracity. There was a pathologist, Cyril Vecht, who said procedures in the film looked technically authentic, uh, along with Stan Winston, the, the makeup and effects guru, and uh, the cinematographer, Alan Davia. The whole thing was just presented in such a breathless, gish gallop sort of fashion, and really quite uncritical at that. And its entire connotation that this was it, this was proof. Here we are, aliens are landed on Earth. Here's a picture of one of them being cut up. Predictably, given the cultural atmosphere at the time, it caused a bit of an uproar. Uh, in fact, it, such was its impact, the viewing figures actually went up on subsequent screenings every single time. It was shown three or four times, and each time more people watched it. Also, its home video release afterwards was only outsold by, um, the, by that year's Michael Jackson one. It was that big. It was massive. Time magazine went as far as to compare its significance with that of the Zapruder film of Kennedy's assassination. They took it very, very seriously. However, behind the scenes, there were deep misgivings about it right from the off. John Jobson, who was the director tasked to put together the other factors of the programme, such as the interviews and so on, told the producer Robert Kiviat from the very beginning that he suspected the entire thing was actually a fake. Uh, and following his interview with Santini, he became more and more convinced that something just wasn't adding up. The producers, however, had their eyes on the ratings. And of course, it was proving that more and more people were watching each time it's repeated and the videos were flying off the shelves. So they made it pretty clear that any suspicions would not be dealt with in any way at all. Certainly not for the time being, while the cash registers were rolling. Stan Winston subsequently claimed that his interview had been so heavily edited that he couldn't even recognise what he'd said. Um, it implied that he was unsure about whether or not it was a fake, whereas, in fact, he'd said from the very start it was a fake, and he'd have been able to do it, in fact, somewhat better. Uh, and the UFO investigator, Kevin Randall, um, had also stated right from the beginning that he thought it was a hoax. And this, of course, didn't make the final cut either. At the time, however, this didn't really break the surface, such was the brouhaha that it had entailed. Entire magazines were formed around the footage. If anybody remembers, Yuri Geller actually started one called, I don't know, Encounters Magazine or something like that. And on the front page, there was this very picture. Nascent internet forums, because this was 1995, suddenly lit up with people either predicting the great official alien revelation, which, of course, we've been told to expect on a fortnightly basis since 1955, and certainly as of today still hasn't happened, but hey-ho, 
Um, and people, on the other hand, dismissing it as fake purely on the basis that there's no such thing as Asians because they said so. You know, QED, the discussion continues there as well. The film itself, meanwhile, continued to receive a great deal of scrutiny. A detailed report in Nexus magazine, October 96, by Michael Heisman, examined it from multiple angles, in concluding, while nobody has been able to present any proof that the Santilli autopsy footage was faked, we have some very convincing indications the film might very well be genuine. If it is a hoax, it is definitely the most ingenious fake of the century. Mike Maloney, the mirror photographer who claimed to have seen it in the 70s, said he thought it was probably the same footage he'd seen. Others were a lot less convinced, however. Um, Philip Mantle of Bufora, who had initially expressed optimism about the content and was indeed quite, quite looking forward to it, um, basically had in the for and has in the following quarter of a century actually made, more and spent a career out of examining the footage itself and the story surrounding it. Um, basically, after a very, very short time, also concluded it was a fake. Um, as always, though, skeptics dismissed and believers endorsed with the usual spectrum of opinion in between them. And so the is it, isn't it debate just rumbled on. Uh, by the end of the 90s, as we all know, these things are cyclical. Um, things like Most Haunted were starting to come to the fore a little bit. And so by the end of the 90s, public ardour for all things alien had really calmed down a lot. And so what had once been an old tsunami of discussion had basically retreated all the way out, just leaving little isolated rock pools of bickering. Uh, with it, presumably, its general lucrativeness had also died up somewhat. So it's perhaps unsurprising that about 10 years on, in 2005, it became known that a film was being made that would dramatise the events leading up to the broadcast. A hint about the overall treatment of the saga could be found in the casting. The stars of the movie would be Anton Deck. A serious docudrama this wasn't probably going to be. Rather a knockabout farce in which terms, in fairness, most researchers would already readily categorise the entire story. The movie Alien Autopsy, written by William Davis and uh, directed by Johnny Campbell, was apparently based wholly on Santilli's description of events. It was due for general release in the UK on the 7th of April 2006. What seemed odd to so many was that the usually insistent Santilli would knowingly and willingly participate in a film that which made a comedy out of his putatively serious, earth-shattering discovery. In the words of Dr David Clark in the FT, But why was the man who discovered the greatest story ever sold selling out by making a comedy, even one billed as being based on a true story. The reason soon became clear. Santilli was finally going to reveal the real truth about the AA film, and it could be no coincidence this truth was to be revealed two days before the film hit the cinemas on the 7th of April. I do it in a Sheffield accent, but it's rubbish. So you have to just imagine that was Dave Clark saying that. And so it came to pass. On the 4th of April, Sky broadcast Eamon Investigates Alien Autopsy featuring the forensic journalistic skills we all admire of Eamon Holmes. Uh, the same Eamon Holmes who has since distinguished himself by quoting David Icke about COVID and so on. This was hardly Pulitzer material, though, of course. Again, to quote David Clark, this was post-modern docu-comedy at its very best, or very worst, with all parties clearly in the know and just hamming it up to create yet another truth about the AA film. These truths, by the way, are originally in inverted commas. Santilli used it as a showcase in order to present his revised version of events. And in person, directly, and before everyone else saw it on the big screen, reenacted by the cheeky chappy Geordies. He was going to partially come clean. The aliens in the film, he admitted, were actually fake. The autopsy footage obviously, therefore, was also fake. The weird extraterrestrial internal gubbins, sheep's brains and jelly, mostly, stuffed into the puppets made by a local sculptor called John Humphreys, not the newsreader, who also created various props 
that were presented as alien artifacts and who himself appeared in the sequence as one of the pathologists performing the post-mortem. However, and on this Santilli was quite clear, despite all the above, it wasn't a hoax. Oh no, the footage is in fact a faithful recreation of the real film Santilli had first seen back in 1992 and had spent so much of his hard-earned cash buying. Tragically, that original footage had apparently degraded to the extent that it was unusable, thus effectively forcing Santilli to remake it in order to get the truth out because it was so important. So, painstakingly and with the greater good at heart, alongside the need to recoup his huge alleged expenditure, he lovingly remade it frame by frame, incorporating the very few frames of the original that had been salvageable, but he couldn't remember which ones those were. Sorry. The film statement by the alleged cameraman, oh, an elderly homeless bloke they'd found in Los Angeles. They'd uh, got him into a shower, put some thrift store clobber on him and got him to recite a script to camera in a motel room for 20 bucks, you know, in keeping with all the best dubious footage. The whole thing just came over as a bit of a lovable rogue wheeler dealer who'd come across something amazing, suffered a major setback, but had used his ingenuity and sheer gumption to overcome in it and, in so doing, reveal an amazing secret to the world in as good a way as he possibly could in the absence of any actual evidence. The imminent alien autopsy film starring Newcastle's finest would, of course, tell a story. So there we go. Enjoy the movie. Then we can all move on. Neatly tied up then. Happy days. Troubles around. Bye. Except, of course, it's not remotely neatly tied up. As we see frequently with Fortune events, the narrative takes on a life of its own, regardless of, or often as not directly because, of what the participants or alleged participants themselves say. Santilli's version of events had been, and continues to be, challenged from quite early in the saga. TV producer and stage magician Spiros Malaris has long claimed that, in fact, he was responsible for the faked footage, and that Santilli's role was purely that of promoter. According to Malaris, Santilli had stuck with his story of unusable footage, so the idea was in fact cooked up to fake the footage, give, not sell, it to TV channels around the world, create a buzz, and then reveal. Um, Channel 4 in the UK got it for free, and Malaris says uh, Santilli had actually sold it on the quiet elsewhere, uh, and the proceeds of which presumably he kept to himself. Malaris also maintains he made all of the auxiliary footage, such as finding the aforementioned um, homeless man pouring coffee in one end of him, then in turn pouring him into some decent trousers and telling him what to say. Malaris had gone into some detail about the process, certainly. But sadly, and this is a major sticking point across the board, there is no proof beyond the anecdotal. Had Spiros, whilst making the fake footage, made a making of documentary, or even take some still photos, or kept the props used, or even copies of the original film, um, as all the preview footage had been transferred to video, this would prove the actual provenance conclusively. He says he has receipts for Fuji stock film being processed in 1995, but as he was a TV producer, and film stock was still very much in common use, as video tape was not of fantastic quality in the mid-90s, the receipts could be for literally anything. It doesn't say what they actually were. It just shows, shows that it was processed. However, Spiros Malaris has at least kept his story completely consistent and he's receptive to discussion. And indeed, as I've always found him, I have to say, very helpful, friendly and, you know, quite approachable about it all. Um, his story is also in, endorsed by Philip Mantle, uh, who spent more time and energy researching this than anybody else. Uh, indeed, Mantle said it would take Santilli producing the original stock to convince him otherwise. And in fact, that's the same for most people. I think until Santilli can bring up the original stock, which is identifiable, then, you know, that's game over effectively. And to be honest, in the absence of any of this, he does find Malaris's account the most credible. 
What's perhaps surprising, though, is despite this general acceptance, at least not not at least due to the fact that bloke who says he made it saying it's a fake, there are still a number of ufologists who regard it as real and therefore proof of extraterrestrial visitation. Once again, the UFO conspiracy specialists insist the doubt and scepticism is a black op. It's basically designed to discredit Santilli and in so doing cast doubt on what's actually a genuine film of an alien autopsy. It all goes a bit fractal after this and to pursue it down all of the rabbit holes would need patience, a very powerful torch, a very, very long piece of string and a very large box of aspirin. Uh, not for nothing does Mantle's casebook run to 600 pages, and that's pretty focused. So despite its relatively straightforward appearance, the whole saga is so intricately convoluted that ultimately all you can really do is go with your own gut. Is it real? Is it fake? Is it fake but with real elements? Is it fake but based on a real, now lost footage? 28 years on, with a mountain of claims, counterclaims, discussions, rebuttals, and a feature film about it, the established facts haven't really advanced very much, if indeed at all. And in the absence of physical evidence, the testimony is still all we have. In the quarter century since it first surfaced, the Santilli film has been compared with most of the benchmark image-based Fortean artefacts. As already mentioned, it's been compared by time to the Zapruder film. It's been compared to the Turin Shroud. And because I have to point this out, the Patterson film. You wouldn't forgive me if I didn't. However, in many respects, the closest analogue to the whole saga was yet another storm in a quintessentially British teacup. That being Cottingley. 80 years previously, Elsie Wright and Francis Griffiths had produced photographs that they claimed would back up their own claim that they played with fairies. This was seized upon by, amongst others, Arthur Conan Doyle as proof of not just that particular incident, but evidence, therefore, of the objective existence of fairies full stop. The excitement took off rather more than the children expected. Some less partisan scrutiny inevitably followed. And finally, Elsie and Francis admitted that actually there were pictures that they cut from a book and mounted on pins and photographed. However, crucially, the girls maintained that one of the photographs had actually been real, but they could not remember which one it was. Basically, all of their intentions were pure. What they'd done is they'd done this in order that people would believe them because they weren't believed. So this was a way to prove it to people. The alien autopsy film follows pretty much exactly the same trajectory. Rumor of an incident, apparent visual proof, a lot of brouhaha with authoritative voices weighing in, uh, eventual admission that the footage was fake, but pr crucially the insistence on the part of the main protagonist that a little part of it was actually real. They just couldn't remember which one it was. And also that the actual incident itself was completely true. Again, like Cottingley, it's very unusual in 14 terms, as is generally agreed with a few dissenting voices to be fake. Now, it's very tempting to speculate that had the footage been released 10 years earlier in the mid 80s, post ET and in the midst of the video nasty furore, then the reception would have been much less fervent and far more likely to be dismissed as a stunt if it had even broken the surface. But it wouldn't have been broadcast on any of the major TV channels anyway, pretty much. Uh, if anything, it would have been an and finally at the end of the news at 10. And that would have been it. As it was, in 1995, there was a mass audience primed and ready to accept pictures purportedly showing extraterrestrial beings who looked not unlike the ones they'd seen every Thursday night at eight o'clock. The UFO community buzz about an imminent revelation had been growing steadily louder. The shelves of WH Smith were heaving with paranormal magazines of all different varieties and levels of skepticism and belief. If ever there was a better time to drop a coin into the penny arcade of Fortiana than Ray Santilli 
picked it to the second. And the jackpot? Julie pulled out. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your kind attention. I will take questions. Thank you. Stu, thank you very much on behalf of ASAP for another wonderful chat. Thank you.